Uh, I'd like to start out by welcoming everyone to the Clearwater Baha'i Center. Um, and uh, welcome to our program, Meeting of the Minds. For anyone who might be uh, here for the first time, it's an ongoing program about every month. Every once in a while we skip a month here and there. But about every month in which we have uh, various speakers who come and speak to us on thought-provoking topics. Our speaker this evening is a perennial favorite, Dr. John Hatcher. And uh, let me r raise your hand if you have heard Dr. Hatcher speak before. If you have heard him speak before. Look at all those hands. It's almost everyone here. And uh, they didn't just come for the food or they'd be leaving by now. They've eaten. But they're staying. And they're staying because we love to hear Dr. Hatcher speak. Uh, I've heard him with so many others here on numerous occasions, and he has never failed to say something that is thought-provoking, informative, enlightening, inspiring. He is just an amazing and very, very uh, knowledgeable man. Uh, he also is an author. Now, I'm going to just read from, I'm going to cheat a little bit and read from the back of his latest book. Uh, this book is called The Social Imperative in Personal Salvation, The Ascent of society, and there's his name right there at the bottom, John S. Hatcher. We, uh, I'm, I'm doing a shameless plug here for Dr. Hatcher's book. He did not ask me to, but we do have this book in the bookstore. And since we also have Dr. Hatcher here, maybe for anyone who's interested in purchasing the book, he might even sign your copy. You can have an actual autographed copy of Dr. Hatcher's book. And uh, I, I, I got to tell you, I'll, I'll admit I haven't read it, but I did leaf through it and, and you know, kind of picked up a few things here and there, and it's very, very good. I can say that off of just the glimpses that I've had. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read uh, his little bio here on the back. John S. Hatcher holds a BA and an MA in English Literature from Vanderbilt University and a PhD in English Literature from the University of Georgia. He is the Director of Graduate Studies in English Literature at the University of South Florida in Tampa, of course. A widely published poet and distinguished lecturer, he has written numerous books on literature, philosophy, and Baha'i theology and scripture, and it does list those books here. He and his family live on a farm near Plant City, Florida. Who knew? Plant City. I won't go there. I'll go to Plant City. Uh, I won't go with what I was thinking. But Dr. Hatcher, we really appreciate your coming. We look forward to everything you have to say. Folks, let's give a big round of applause to Dr. John Hatcher. Uh, I'm tearing up my power talk that I had prepared. Instead, I'm going to just read you something. Uh, I'm not really done it. My wife told me to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to discuss tonight, and I hope you will pitch in, uh, because I doubt we get through the whole PowerPoint presentation. Uh, instead, I'd rather dwell on certain salient points that will emerge as we talk. First of all, I need to know to whom I'm talking, so I know there's some Baha'is here. Uh, how many people uh, here are, are not members of the Baha'i community? And I can't see you now, but I can see hands. <laughs> All right. So we have 10 or so people. How many people here have never been to a Baha'i fireside or presentation before? One, two, three, four, okay. All right, I, I ask that simply, uh, not to embarrass you, but simply so I can know how uh, uh, far back I need to begin my presentation so far as uh, the perspective on the Baha'i faith. So let, let me begin by simply saying the Baha'i faith, as uh, you, you may well know, is a world religion. It's not a sect of another religion. It's not an offshoot of another religion. It is not syncretic or synthetic. That is, it's not something devised by a group of people who thought it would be a nice idea to bring it about, nor is it combined from the parts of some other religion. It is an independent world religion that began about oh, 150 years ago 
and it began uh, in the context of a Muslim culture in the same way that Christianity began in the context of the Jewish culture and religion. And like early Christianity, the most inveterate, uh, inveterate uh, persecutors uh, and disdainers of the religion in the beginning were the members of the clergy of the religion to whom the founders of the Baha'i Faith appeared. Uh, in the same way that Christ was brought before the Sanhedrin to be adjudged by the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. And, uh, and yet also we have to recognize that necessarily the first followers of Christ were Jews and the first followers of the Baha'i Faith uh, were Muslims. So on the one hand, uh, it is a great bounty for the followers of the previous religion to be the first followers of the next religion. At the same time, it is a great test, a judgment, a judgment upon humanity that occurs every time a prophet appears. And this brings us to the first and most central theme of the Baha'i teachings, or the foundational premise on which all Baha'i thought is based, and that is that there is a God who is a cognitive being beyond our exact understanding, but whose evidences are all around us, and who has determined to educate humankind, his progeny, if you will, his creation by means of successive teachers throughout human history. And in fact, the Baha'i writings say that without the appearance of these prophets, these messengers, there would be no human civilization, that all human advancement derives from this spiritual impetus, this spiritual power that is unleashed when a new prophet appears. So it is not incorrect to say that Baha'is believe that all the religions are really one religion revealed in progressive and successive stages of enlightenment and education, very purposefully. Why? Why can't simply one revelation be enough? And many religions think that one is enough or that there will be no more because there doesn't need to be any more. Well, it, it, as you know, we as human beings never outgrow our need for further enlightenment and instruction and infusion of love and because there is no end to the possibilities of our spiritual and intellectual development. So how can there ever be enough? How can we ever say, well, we've got it done now? But that's the topic that I'm dealing with, this concept of salvation. Now, if you look up the word salvation, on a search engine for the Bible or for the Baha'i scriptures, you will find it doesn't appear that often. It's a concept, that, uh, the, the term itself is really a sort of modern contrivance. Not the idea it represents, but the word itself. What do you think salvation means in contemporary society and so far as most religions are concerned? Anybody, what does the word salvation connote to you? When you hear it used, what does it imply? Or what does it imply for you, to you? Saving your soul. Save. Saving, who said saving your soul? He did. Okay, saving, uh, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> no, <laughs> you foolish person, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, uh, and what does saving one's soul mean? Since a soul is a metaphysical essence, how does one, what do you, obviously it doesn't mean literally that you're going to tuck it away somewhere. What do you mean by that? So in other words, paraphrase that. Give me another term for it. Uh, being faithful. But if you are being faithful, can you not also degenerate into infidelity tomorrow? The concept of salvation as it is normally used means something more than a one-shot thing. Does it not? Somebody give me a little 
uh, additional. What you say is correct. Let's add to it now. Yes. Is it, uh, life? Well, it, the, exactly. Your your salvation it means literally to to uh, safeguard your life, and of course your soul is at the, the heart of your existence. Uh, so to be saved in that sense, uh, we mean the same thing we do in a literal sense. If you are saved physically, you are saved from what? Evil. Death. Evil or death. All right? And those things are often synonymous in Scripture. But the term also has a sense of finality to it in most religious contexts. Now, I grew up in the Methodist Church. I became a Baha'i when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, and have been studying it ever since. And what the Baha'i faith did to me when it explained to me that my religion I had grown up with, which I knew was a successor to, to Judaism, Judaism because I believed Christ was the Messiah uh, in fulfillment of Jewish prophecy, what the Baha'i teachings did was give me a wider perspective or a deeper perspective about what Christ was saying when he alluded to the prophets who came before him and to the ones who would come after him. When he talks about the comforter and the counselor and the, uh, uh, the second coming and so on. And one thing uh, that is tremendously in, important in, in the things he says is that no man cometh unto the Father except by me. Now, on the one hand, that would imply that the only religion that is of any merit is Christianity, if you take that literally, uh, uh, or if you take it as his referring to himself as the single time in history that God intervened. What the Baha'i writings explained to me, and what suddenly made it very clear to me when he says, you who have seen me have seen the Father, for I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. How can you say, show us the Father? If you see me, you see the Father. And what the Baha'i writings say is, these individual teachers who come every 500 to 1,000 years aren't just ordinary human beings who are inspired are very spiritual. They are of another order of being altogether. They are divine and beyond human understanding and beyond anything we could aspire to, even if we chose to. And of course, we choose to try to emulate the example that they set forth in their own teachings. So the first job we have, the Baha'i writings, says is to understand this concept that God does not come down as a metaphysical being to earth, but sends representatives of himself who are likened to exact mirrors of his attributes. That is, each of these, what Baha'is call manifestations. Manifestations, which means they, what do you do when you manifest something? Yes. You represent something in your appearance, or in, in other words, you make it evident, you make it apparent, you make it clear. So if I manifest uh, kindliness, then I am kind to people. All right. Now, uh, these manifestations then are divinely sent emissaries who represent God both in the message they bring, the teachings and laws they give, and in their person. They are perfect. They are flawless, immaculate beings. So to see them is to have a perfect manifestation of godliness, as if you could hold a mirror up to God and say, I can't see God, but I can see all of the qualities in that mirror reflected, all of the attributes of God. Now, the Baha'i writings say that I any of us can do that. That is, any of us and all of us manifest the attributes of God to a greater or lesser degree. And the more we strive to do this, the more exactly we can do that, though it, you never get an end point. You never uh, can stop being more just or more kind or more loving. All right? But 
the manifestations come into this world already doing that and doing it perfectly, flawlessly, even though we may not understand all the ways they work. So on one hand you could say, well, Christ is so kind and loving to the children. Uh, Christ uh, is, uh, gave his life rather than deny that he was the Messiah. Because uh, all he had to do was say, You're, I'm nobody, you know. But he didn't do that. He told the Sanhedrin exactly who he was and all who would listen, that he was indeed the fulfillment. And on the cross, his dying words were, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, was he in despair? How could a perfect representative of God be in despair? He's flawless. So what was he doing? Well, if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, if you have one, if you don't get one, that has footnotes, and it will tell you that he's quoting from the scriptures of the Old Testament. He is telling them you are crucifying the very one you have waited for hundreds of years to appear. You're crucifying your Messiah. And you're going to realize this when you think about what I'm saying. And if you go to the Psalm 22, for example, you will see in that psalm a description of the crucifixion. Psalms were written 500 years before Christ. And yet there is a perfect description of his being crucified on the cross, even the gambling at the, uh, the bottom of the cross for his robes and so on. Now what does this have to do with salvation? Well, it has to do with a couple of things. First of all, it has to do with a sort of insidious thing that crops up among religions. From a Baha'i perspective, quite unnecessarily, where each religion comes to think that it is not a way, but the only way to God. And so if you look at a picture of the Baha'i House of Worship, Baha'i Houses of Worship have as their unique structural similarity, even though they may be in various architectural styles, a central dome surrounded at uh, at the ground level by nine equal doors, nine doors all the same, symbolizing the religions of the world all as doorways to the same God. This concept of unity of all the religions of God, as, as I say, is the hallmark of Baha'i belief. And yet it is not simply that they all just kind of come here and there, and this one's good and that one has this, and I think I'll choose that one because I like their cathedrals very much, or I'll go there because I like to meditate and they do a lot of, no, that's not it. God is more intelligent than that. God is at least as intelligent as we are. God has a plan, and the plan is systematically to reveal these prophets so that they bring what is needed at any given point in history, and what the capacity of humankind is at that point in history to understand more about reality, not just physical reality, and not just spiritual reality, but the totality of reality both its physical and metaphysical aspects, because the Baha'i writings say that each of these two types of reality are the exact counterpart of the other. If you can understand something about one, it will lead you to an understand about something, uh, understanding about something of the other. So if you can understand the laws of gravity, then you can understand the laws of love. And conversely, if you can understand how love works, you can understand how gravity works. And the more you study physical reality, the more you'll understand about spiritual reality and back and forth. So in other words, scientists as atheistic or a uh, uh, philosophical as they uh, m may tend to be at times, ultimately will discover the alliance of both of these realities, that they're really part of one creation of God. Why? Because that's the truth. And ultimately, 
you go to the truth because it's the shortest distance between your question and your answer. All right? That's called Occam's razor for those of you who are philosophical historical buffs. It means the simplest answer will ultimately emerge as the correct answer. And so we no longer believe the earth is the center of the universe in spite of what the church said to Copernicus in the 16th century because it just got too cumbersome to use the Ptolemaic system. And so they said, mm, Copernicus uh, system works. Let's, uh, let's see what happens if we say that the sun is the center of the solar system, okay? Well, salvation. What is salvation? When I was being raised in the Methodist church, there was a lady, Mrs. Brown, who taught Sunday school, or tried to, to those of us who, even in spite of our white middle class suits and cleanliness, were recalcitrant and uh, incorrigible. And so we would sit there and she would preach at us, and one particular Sunday I remember, uh, all these years later, she asked, how many of you have been saved today? Now I won't question her motives, whether she was trying to put another check mark on her afterlife score, or whether she really wanted to know if she'd had any effect on us. but there was an implicit pressure there that you wanted to be saved. And uh, since we hadn't done this before, I guess we had to figure if you didn't raise your hand, you weren't saved. So even though we had our, we were supposed to have our eyes closed, but I peeked and I was the only one who raised my hand. Now I really hadn't been saved. Uh, that is, I hadn't gone through some transformational experience that made me any different than I was the day before but I didn't want to make Mrs. Brown feel bad or make her not love me. And so she said, well, that's wonderful. Someone's been saved today. Well, it, the point is that the concept I was dealing with then in the context of what I was being taught by that particular minister in that church was that once I was saved, I never had to worry again. But nothing I did, as long as I had accepted Jesus Christ, I was safe, which meant I would go to heaven. But then the minister made the mistake of describing heaven to me. And it was boring. It was, it, it, it says there, there, you just sit around, you don't have to do anything and so on. Well, I was 12 years old, you know. And doing nothing was hell to me. And so uh, I uh, decided that there must be something more to salvation than what he was describing. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about the Christian or Muslim the concepts of salvation or, or any other religion. Suffice it to say that the term has the connotation of achieving a point of no return. That is where you don't ever have to worry about falling away because even though your actions may belie the fact that you're saved, you're okay, you're safe, you're gonna go to heaven. Now, the Muslim uh, teachings are much the same. If you're a Muslim, you go to heaven. What is a Muslim? One who accedes to the will of God. And that's what the Quran means by it. It doesn't mean someone who has the name Muslim, who signed a card saying, I'm a member of the Islamic faith. It means someone who is submissive before God, who submits to the will of God. And so he calls Abraham, Muhammad does, a Muslim. And he talks about whenever we bring the book, well, what does he mean by book? Not the Quran. He means any time any of these manifestations bring new teachings, that's the book, the book of God for that day. And everything before that 
is in the past. It's an important past. You need to learn that past. But your guidance for today is what I bring you. So each of these manifestations brings two things, two kinds of teachings. They bring the law, which may have to do with how you conduct yourself every day, or how you as a community deal with problems, or organize yourselves, and so on. The new church, the new structure, and how you operate within it. And a further explanation of spirituality and the spiritual uh, of reality in general as exemplified by their own behavior. So every manifestation is the exemplar of his own teachings. And one of the great proofs of the manifestations is themselves. So if you want to understand what they mean, as Christ says, you know, if you don't understand what I'm saying, then just follow me because of the works I do. In effect, if, you're, if, if that's too much for you to understand, then if you like what I've done, then, then follow me. That'll be sufficient. But at the same time, Christ makes it very clear, as does Muhammad, as does Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, that really two things are essential for salvation. One is to recognize the manifestation and accept it as your most propitious path to God for that time. So when Christ says, I am the way, I am the truth, the light, whoever follows me is following God. Uh, each of the manifestations says the same thing, the exact same thing in one way or another. If you see me and follow me, two things, recognize who I am and why I've come, and then do what I tell you. Neither is sufficient without the other. In other words, as Christ says, it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord. You've got to do what I tell you to do. Follow my teachings or else you're like a man who built his house on a foundation of sand and when the wind come and the rains come, it washes that foundation away and you're done for. So there are always these two pillars of salvation. To recognize what God has sent you as a way to understand Him and to enjoy that love. And secondly, a system to guide your daily conduct. So Christ says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But then immediately after he says that, he gives you new laws in fulfillment of the law. And he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, and I tell you, no. I'm changing that law. Turn the other cheek. Right. And he says, uh, marriage law. Sorry, I'm changing that. No more divorces. <laughs> Except in certain, certain matters. Matters of infidelity and so on. Right. He gives you three chapters of laws in Matthew. And then he says, it's not enough just to follow me because you admire my miracles I've done or you think that I'm a wonderful person. So you've got to change your life. Each works on the other. The more you change your life, the more you understand the manifestation. The more you understand, the more you're inspired to become different. Now, as I say, every prophet says this same thing, and this law is binding. Here and hereafter, and here's another important concept of the Baha'i faith, the concept of what is the essential human reality. The essential human reality, and I'm going to ask these two young men here, because they're very nice uh, and very attentive, and I appreciate it when the young people come and are so well behaved and so obviously intelligent. So, what, what is the essential reality of any human being? 
the essential reality. What is the part of you that will continue after your body grows old and deceases? The soul. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Give me something that the soul enables you to do that without it you couldn't do. For example, uh, huh? Imagination. Beautiful. Imagination. Pardon? The capacity to understand virtues and then to take that understanding and put it in action. So if I say, be good, that, that doesn't help you much, does it? You've then got to take that concept of goodness and figure out, what does he want me to do? And you'll have to put yourself in a situation, yes? Understanding. Understanding the brain, the mind. All right. All of these are properties of the soul, including memory, reason, imagination, will. All of these are powers not of this hunk of meat up here, as beautiful and magnificent as it is. It's a transceiver from your soul, which though associating with your body is not in your body or of your body, it is working by means of your body. Right? And so will is not, doesn't originate here. It comes from your soul through here. So if I want to raise my hand, well, I just did it. How did that happen? Because I willed it to happen. I, what is I? I is my spiritual reality operating for a time, a very brief time, through this body. Why brief? Because the Baha'i writings say, as all the other religions do, your soul is immortal. You're stuck with yourself forever. That's sort of a negative way to look at it. So you better like yourself, and if you don't, you better get to like yourself. And if you're not satisfied with yourself, you better work on it. Because you've got from now to eternity to do it, which is one way of looking at it. But also, it'd be nice to enjoy the present tense, wouldn't it? So it's both a, an existential command, meaning to enjoy the present while you're, you know, it's, you don't have to wait for some future time to go to heaven. You can do it right here. Because salvation from a Baha'i point of view is not a single point of attainment. It is not a point where you say to Mrs. Brown, I've been saved. In which case she should have said, Prove it. Show me. Well, I hope I've shown her a few things since then. Uh, don't know. You see, that's the thing. You can't judge how anyone else is doing. You can't even judge how you're doing, which is kind of a fearful thing. This is sort of what we call the fear of God that keeps you uh, what, uh, following the commandment that Baha'u'llah gives, which is, bring thyself into account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. Meaning, at some point, maybe tonight, you're going to pass from this associational relationship with this body to a relationship where it is more pure and undefiled with God. But you're going to begin there where you leave off here. It's really no there, is it? I mean, it's a, you're there. You're already in that spiritual realm. It's just God has arranged it so that you're being tested right now. You're in a play. You're playing a character in a play. All right? But the real essence of that character emanates from your soul. So each prophet then brings these two things, himself and his guidance. And the most recent of these Baha'is believe is Baha'u'llah, who though persecuted throughout his life after declaring himself the promised one of all ages, the second coming of Christ, the, the, the uh, the promised return of all religions, the founders of all religions, though not the last, and, and in a sense, not the best in the sense that they're all, they all have the same capacity, 
come with the same message, are aware of each other, talk about each other, and Baha'u'llah says, in the spiritual realm before they appear here, they consult with each other and have a plan. You know, okay, it's your turn. You, you try to work with them, I couldn't do much. <laughs> they stayed in the desert for 40 years and I couldn't, uh, I still couldn't help them a whole lot. You know. Well, you know, in Mohammed's Baba said, look at what they're doing. Uh, they're, they're divided up and killing each other. Well, uh, there is progress, and it's an endless process, and that is, even though Baha'u'llah says, this is the day which all the prophets of the past have waited for, the day when humankind will finally collectively understand who they are, that they are essentially spiritual beings, and that the whole plan of God is that this planet become one spiritualized community, governing itself according to spiritual principles and looking out for the, the justice and health and well-being of every person on it. This is the plan of God. And human, humankind in this day in which you live is the point of maturation where we finally have an understanding of why we're here and what the job to do is, but it doesn't stop there anymore that when, what are you, 14, 15, 16? For me? Yes. 12. 12. <laughs> How about you? What day is that? 14. And are you a Baha'i? Yes. Yes. And so what happens next year? And what else? <laughs> Let the 12 year old tell you. Yeah. <laughs> huh? I'm 15. And that will mean? Uh, I'm a Baha'i part. Uh, yes, you, you are already a Baha'i, but you are, have achieved the age of maturity. You are then responsible for following all the laws of the Baha'i faith and keeping all of the commandments of Baha'u'llah. All right, you are responsible for your own spiritual growth. Now, of course, you always have help. You always have to have help. We all do. And that's the second part of what I wanted to tell you tonight about this concept of salvation. And it has to do with this book that uh, uh, has just been published called The Ascent of Society, The Social Imperative in Personal Salvation, though when he reversed it, I like that. So you can say that's the title and that's the subtitle, I don't care. But here's the important thing, as you can see, social imperative, well what's an imperative? An imperative means something you must do. It's something you don't have a choice about. Right. It's imperative that you do this. Well, it's imperative that if you want personal salvation, you've got to be involved with other people. Why is that? Why is that? Now think about it. Why is that? That if you want to be a spiritual person, you can't go to a mountain retreat, at least not for very long, and stay there and meditate and become spiritual. Why? Let me have some good answers. Yes, ma'am. Because you're, um, you will be isolated and you won't be able to talk to people. Excellent response. You'll be isolated and you won't be able to talk to people. Why is that important that you not be isolated and talk to people? First, your, your name is? Mateen. 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 Oh, yes. Okay. Mateen. Um, I'm, get, I'm just like taking a guess, um, because you won't be able to um, practice your virtues. Because you want to practice your virtues. In other words, the guy in the mountain retreat, as you said, is isolated. How could he practice his virtues? And if you don't practice them, you don't under, really understand them. <coughs> what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say just about the same thing as him. Except uh, that's the only way your spirit grows, is if, with you, if you're with other people so you can practice your virtues. It's totally theoretical. He said that's the only way your spirit grows. The Bahrain said precisely that. Without, it's like a muscle. 
If you don't stress the muscle, it's not going to get any stronger than it is. And when you stress it, then it starts to grow. All right? Same thing with your spirit. And if you don't put it into practice under difficult circumstances sometimes, you don't develop. It's one thing, it's easy to be kind when you're by yourself. <laughs> it may be easy to be kind in the context of your family, though that's becoming a, a, a real challenge in contemporary society. But it's hard to be kind when you're with people that you don't know particularly well or don't particularly agree with on lots of things. So there is a social element in every aspect of your spiritual development, beginning when you're young with your family and your friends, and then as you grow older with your fellow citizens. And Baha'u'llah says, and now the time has come to be establish this relationship with this whole global community. Why? Because he says, the world has become one country and humankind its citizens. He says mankind has become its citizens. He doesn't say, wouldn't it be nice if this were one world community? He says, little as you know it, it's already happened. He said this 150 years ago. And so now we have it, that is, we have the community, but we don't have the infrastructure. Where is the infrastructure for this world community? Where is the social mechanism to put into practice, both on a personal level and on a collective level, the means for our individual and collective spiritual salvation or development. Where is it? Yes. In the Baha'i writings? Where in the Baha'i writings? Um, I'm really going to test you now. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the Kitab like you said, and... Um, oh, is that what he said? This 12-year-old said the Kitab does. And he's right. The most holy book of the Baha'i writings is the Kitab Yagdas, which means the most holy book. And it's most holy because it contains all of the rules from the most personal behavior of washing yourself and cutting your fingernails and everything dealing with your family. He rebuilds the family. He rebuilds the community. And he gives you a blueprint for rebuilding or constructing the first global community. And what else were you going to say? What other writings? Um, what was it again? <laughs> um, uh, there is also World World Order. It's not written by Baha'u'llah, but it's a collective. It's a collective. The World Order Baha'u'llah? Uh, yes. The World Order Baha'u'llah is a, b a beautiful response, because that is a book by the guardian of the Baha'i faith, the great grandson of Baha'u'llah, whose authority it was as given by Baha'u'llah through Abdul Baha to begin constructing this global community. And so that's what the Guardian did, was to make strategic plans for the establishment of the pillars of the ultimate edifice of the Baha'i world the Universal House of Justice. And those pillars are the national communities, the national spiritual assemblies throughout the world. And the World Order of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi, describes how that process will occur, the stages it will go through, where we are right now, what's going to happen next, and so on. The main thing you've got to understand is this. Baha'u'llah says there will be another manifestation after him, and this process will continue to grow and develop. So what's so remarkable about this day and this age? Because this is the turning point, just as when you become 15, it'll be a turning point in your responsibilities in your life, though you won't feel it much because you're obviously already there. But for many people, it is a tremendous turning point. So for our global community, which is unaware of this identity it has, there's got to be a lot of change. And Baha'u'llah spells out what those changes need to be. A universal auxiliary language, a universal policing force comprised of all uh, uh, 
contributions, constituent members from all the global communities. So that if any nation rises against another nation, that nation will be su suppressed. Uh, and uh, the equality of men and women, the abolition of prejudice, whether of race or religion, or any other accord. So Baha'u'llah spells out what's different. What's different is we will never again go through this remarkable transition of going from scattered religions and scattered identities to one global community, one human family. Now we'll take that, once we've got it, and refine it and refine it and refine it. That's what salvation means in the Baha'i faith. And I'm going to stop with this explanation. Salvation from a Baha'i point of view means to be in progress, means to be gaining spiritual attributes, whether as an individual or as a community or as a global society. And as we've already seen, you can't become spiritual without putting into practice. The more you put it into practice, the more you understand it. The more you understand it, the more completely you can express it. These are reciprocal actions. So salvation never stops. It doesn't mean you have to wait endlessly to benefit from it. As I say, you can experience heaven on earth right now. There's nothing to wait for. So that if you live life well according to the way the manifestations guide you, the transition, and you've seen this, probably half the people in here have experienced the loss of a, of a friend or a loved one, where the transition from this life to the other was so easy and so simple because they were ready. They were in motion. And so there was hardly, there's a beautiful poem by uh, John Donne, English poet, and it's called Valediction Forbidding Mourning. And forbidding not M-O-R-N, but M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. A valediction forbidding weeping and, con and being concerned with the parting. And he's talking at the time the speaker is to his beloved wife, whom he must leave. And he says, let us, uh, let us part in such a way that there is no visible evidence of our, our having parted. Let us part without weeping, without wailing. Uh, and he makes a couple of beautiful analogies of what he wishes. And he says, as a piece of ice, would melt into two parts. You can't really say at what point are they two. It's very subtle, subtle difference. All right, and uh, he gives you several other uh, 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 analogies within that. But one he gives that's particularly appropriate to what I'm saying is he says, as a dying man passes on, a righteous man passes on to the next world, and, and some of his sad friends say, the breath goes now, and some say no. So let us part and make no noise. So he says, a righteous man, when he dies, peacefully, you know. Well, I don't know if that happens every time, but it, the idea is, is interesting. It is that when we leave this mechanism through which we are working in this temporary time of our lives, this foundational time of our lives, uh, we will part from it happily because we no longer need it. We've done, we've used it well. We've learned what we needed to know. And the, what we do after that, we continue to learn and to do. And that's the, the last thing I want to say, and that is, it's no different after this life. There is a service in both worlds. The Baha'i writings say this very clearly. 
So this commandment that we recognize that prophet and follow his teachings, we don't leave it behind. That's a definition of what a human soul is, a being that has the capacity to recognize the Creator through his representatives and to transform himself or herself to become ever more spiritual without end, without end. Because the writings say, even though you will never become anything other than a human soul, that human soul has infinite capacity, endless capacity. Right. Thank you.